since 2019, we are we are facing an extreme drought, which has affected all the biodiversity here in Pantanal, and the others were were also affected. Are are being affected, and the fires came in 2020 with um, extreme strength, and uh, it happened uh, when usually giant otters have clear cubs. So we didn't find cubs in 2020, probably because of the fires, the direct, direct impact on, on the survivorship of these cubs. In other areas uh, where there was not fire, most of the population didn't breed. So probably because of the drought too. Everything is burned. I don't know what to say. I think all hope is gone. It's difficult to stay here. It's very hot. The air is, is hard to breathe. Tongues of fire getting up 20, 30 meters higher than this electricity post. Wow. And engulfed the wooden bridges. I was 53 then and had never seen in all my life a forest fire of such intensity here in the Pentagon. While we were fighting, the fire jumped the road and was sort of surrounding us and started pushing a bit further west. Fire was spinning around us. We were, we, everywhere you looked, there was fire. Where my husband has a lodge, it was completely burned and the animals started to appear, burned, and then we started to understand what was happening. It was a very bad feeling. everybody for joining us today. My name is Katerina Campagna and I'm here with the winner of the best short form documentary of uh, the Her Vision Film Festival, fourth year, fourth edition, uh, Miss Dr. Susan Purs um, and her winning film is Saving Jaguars, Saving Ourselves. 
So um, yes, Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Katarina. And it's quite an honor to, to be selected in the Her Vision Film Festival and also to be chosen as a winner. I'm, I was just over the moon thrilled to find that out. So it's really an honor and I appreciate it. Honor is all ours, really. You no, know, you've made such a remarkable, remarkable piece on so many levels. I mean, first of all, um, you know, th the subject matter, uh, we'll delve into that because it's very meaty. Um, but just the cinematography is just um, stunning. You you feel like you can reach out and touch these majestic creatures. Um so yeah, seriously, how did you go about this? Um, what was the plan of action? Um, so in terms of how I actually filmed it? Is that yes, yes, yeah, we'll start so, there. Yeah, so um, I had been there previously in 2018 on a nature photography tour. So I knew what it was like to film there, which is really hard. Um, so I rented a Canon R5 mirrorless camera. I don't own it and a long uh, 100 to 500 zoom. So I was, you know, holding the camera like this. And when you're out on the rivers, it's, you know, Abby's Abby's an excellent boat driver. She's, she's very talented, um, but her boat is small and it's flat bottom. And so when you go over these wakes, you know, you, you bounce and then the river is moving, you know, boats are moving around you, the animals are moving. And so I filmed it handheld with that camera um and it honestly you know it gives you the you just stabilize it with your body and um and then I used my um my iPhone uh 13 which had uh for has 4k for some of the interviews in the boats um where I was close and then I used a tripod on land for the land interviews with a a long mic so wow wow yeah no seriously it, it is it's utterly breathtaking because where you are is automatically you know it's automatically built in production value let's say yeah. <laughs> out in the, for people who haven't seen you're out in you know in the um the amazon the uh, pantanal the pantanal yeah the, south of the amazon about 500 miles yeah yeah and so Yes. Sorry. Most people don't know where it, I mean, most people have never heard of it, you know. Yeah. It's such a magical place. It's just it's it's just it's just something that you would think was just the coolest thing to make up in your head. The <laughs> jaguars and little monkeys jumping out of trees and giant batches of parrots, giant jabaroo storks you know, with six or eight foot wing. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating, but really huge wingspans. I mean, six foot at least. I mean, it's just, it's just a magical place. Cute otters that are, you know, they're just playing and romping and they're hilarious. And, you know, came in that look like gators, but they're a little bit more chill. <laughs> <laughs> There's piranhas in the water. Wow. <laughs> you know, so, um, but the jaguars, you know, they they don't attack people. They, you know, the fishermen used to, um, decades ago, used to clean their fish on the beach because of the piranhas. So they left the scraps and the jaguars came and ate the scraps. So they weren't afraid of people. They saw people as an ally and not a threat. So that's really nice. <laughs> how touching, how touching, you know? Yeah, most people don't see people as allies and not a threat. <laughs> <laughs> Jaguars, smarter than humans. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's wonderful. It's See, what a, a lovely insight that you've given us just right there in, in this little clip. I mean, I know no, that's wonderful. I Yeah, no, it's just... It's stunning. So okay, so you went on a on a nature discovery tour, photography tour in 2018, right? What yeah. led you to that? Was it did you have knowledge of the Pantanal beforehand and was like, oh, this is a great vacation for me? 
Has it been a lot of uh, life study? Is that where your doctorate comes in? Um, yeah, just take us through. I'm just fascinated. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I met a, a nature photographer uh, named Mark Thomas, and he started doing tours in all over the world. And the Pantanal was one of the places. And um, I have a journalism degree in photojournalism. So I've been doing video on and off since 1986, mostly for small nonprofits. Um, and I, I, I did a lot since 2000, probably 100 different videos for various nonprofits about social justice mostly. I hadn't done as much about the environment. And um, so I had been taking care of my mother before she passed. And so my life was kind of, you know, small and working full time and coordinating all her sitters. And I wanted to do something exciting and and I love video. And and so I thought I'd never been anywhere but Toronto, Canada for two conferences. I'd never been out of the country. Um, so I thought, well, this would be really fun and exciting adventure. And, um, you know, and then after, you know, after that, I did a, I did a practice. Well, it wasn't, I, I did a, a small video feature film, but it was for YouTube with Abby because I had so much beautiful footage. I wanted to do something with it. And then the fires happened. So, you know, and I, you know, it was hard to watch Abby posting things on Instagram about seeing this absolutely exquisite place burning and, you know, everything everyone was going through. The four firefighter, well, more than four. This was during the pandemic. Wow. So, you know, Abby couldn't go. She was getting messages from people and there's the four um, firefighters plus Raphael and and really just anybody who is there. Um, those four fought, firefighters have fought fires in 2020, 2021, and now 2023. Last fall, the Pantanal burned for two months. And Raphael um, also fought fires that first year. And, you know, he, he lost 20 pounds in a month. They didn't sleep at night. They were working a lot at night. So it's it's kind of like, you know, they weren't trained. They weren't firefighters. They're ranch hands, you know. Wow. There's a biologist out there fighting fires. You know, Abby was fighting fires in 2021. I mean, it begs the question, where is the support? You know, um, any government, any governmental agencies involved, um, any you know, any, any outsour outside resources whatsoever going to help in these instances at all, or? Well, in 2020, um, Bolsonaro was president and he really defunded the environmental agencies. Um, so it took four days for the government to get out there. And, you know, the people who were, one of the firemen said, you know, we were defending our homes. So they were going out in areas that really weren't safe that the government firefighters wouldn't go you know they were walking through jungle to get to the the park to because the park's here then there's panthera ranch and the nonprofit. <clears throat> then there's the town so they were trying to do fire breaks to protect all three but especially to protect the town um so, you know, they're they're encountering water buffaloes, <laughs> you know, there's jaguars walking around, there's, you know, snakes and, you know, it was very, very courageous what they did. But in 2023, of course, Lula da Silva was president. Um, but what happened in 2023 is, it, you know, the Amazon and the Pantanal were both burning largely due to drought. Um, in October and November, because <clears throat> usually the Pentaneros who've been there for generations, they know not to start little small fires, you know, to burn off, you know, brush or whatever during the, those those months. Um, and there's, I think it was like 60 of 62 areas of the state of Amazonas were in state of emergency. So they pulled all the resources from the Pantanal, which aren't many to begin with, 
to fight fires in the national park. And so, you know, that allowed it to get more out of control than it would have been. Um, wow. Wow. You know, Lula has really decreased deforestation dramatically. He He's refunded environmental agencies and people in Brazil have a very strong, you know, average, you know, the average person in Brazil has a very strong environmental sensibility. I mean, I, I had a lot of support and encouragement from people and just the community stepped up to help me do this film. I could not have done it without them. You know, it's just a lot of people volunteered to help because yeah. I had no, I had no funding for this film. So <laughs> that is amazing. God bless you. I mean, really what an undertaking and to see that kind of um, community rally around it is really moving, um, you know, for those who haven't seen it, um, it, it again, it's it's just beautifully breathtakingly done. Um, you know, would have never guessed you're, you're practically a one woman crew out there doing this. Just like, think of that, okay? You're a one woman crew capturing panthers and jaguars and everything. And, um, in a jungle like seriously and there's like fires and snakes and um you know I mean this is just incredible I mean <laughs> well thank you I, I the fire footage is archival I it was okay. filmed by other people so I wasn't there during the fires um but um but yes I, it too <laughs> thank you I did have an interesting experience with the jack war on land by accident um i was out in the boat with abby and we pulled over to use the restroom and uh, they came back and i i went and they were yelling to me susan come here susan come here and i thought why do i need to film something right now what is <laughs> happening and they kept yelling at me and so um I finally started walking back and I looked to my left and there was Madrosa the Jaguar standing oh. there on land and she was about seven feet from me and she was looking where I had come from. So I just sort of ran as fast as I could back because they, the reason they were actually saying Susan stay calm because they were in the boat, then there's the river bank and I was on the other side of the river bank, you know, where people couldn't see and Madrosa was on the riverbank. So she was between me and the boat, which you oh. don't want it to happen. <laughs> so, but she didn't attack me. And, you know, I had my back to her. You're not supposed to run. And she didn't. She was just curious, you know. I so. can just, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know why. My mind just went to like a student filmmaker just like hearing the story and going, and you're not supposed to run from Jack <laughs> Like I'm here to make a movie. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I just like I am not staying here. I mean, and you know, and then we, I kind of slid down the bank, and Abby and Yvonne were standing on the, on the bank, and we were all going, "Oh my god, oh my god, I can't believe this just happened!" And then, and then Madrosa came to the bank, so we jumped in the boat, and you know, went off, and but you know, it just it just goes to show you that. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes jaguars come to the ranch, you know, they do, you know, you do have to be careful with cattle, small children, dogs, because, you know, I mean, they're, they're animals, they're looking for food and they may not realize that a small child is a human, you know, so they have not been any human attacks by jaguars. So... <laughs> Amazing. And now, like, again, it, this story, it's utterly fascinating. I really love how you point to, like, um, it reminds, it's how everything is so interconnected. It reminds me of, I don't remember, was it Einstein who said, like, if the bees go away, we're done for, you know, it's the same kind of interconnected interdependency that you pointed out in this film. If you'd like to touch on that aspect a little bit for our audience that hasn't seen it yet. Um, yeah. Sure. I mean, you know, the jaguar is a keystone species. And, um, you know, so they eat capybaras, which are, you know, large 
rodents after a while they look cute and for when you first see them they're kind of like oh i've never seen something like that before and they eat came in and you know small animals um but you know like paul rad in the film he's a veterinarian he pointed out if we don't have jaguars then capybaras would become overrun and they carry disease they carry you know diseases that could jump to humans they carry you know i can't remember everything he said but you know insects and things so it's really important to have your keystone species keeping everything in balance and the jaguars have brought such a blessing to the local community because of ecotourism it's really raised the standard of living <clears throat> and i you know and some of the times when i was there you know you'd see you know, a young man who's standing behind a counter cooking, but he's got a bird or book in his hand because he wants to become a guide, you know? Wow. You know, wow. and, you know, so there's boat drivers, there's, you know, there's guides, there's, um, you know, there's restaurants, the food, the food there is really good. <laughs> it's really good food. Um you know, and just, it just has raised the standard of living of the whole community. It's really, and it protects jaguars because they used to kill jaguars because jaguars killed cattle. So you have now Panthera Ranch, you know, that's the nonprofit that protects all the big cats, the lions, the snow leopards, the tigers, and they <clears throat> have it, you know, they have their ranch there and they teach local farmers to use electric fences to keep jaguars out. <clears throat> because if a jaguar kills a cow, that's a big loss for a farmer, you know? So, so it's, it's really, and they teach other conservation, it's organic and, you know, they have some solar, they have a solar installation and um, they're, they're doing a lot of great work too. And of course, Abby has, you know, she's, I think the whole echo tour, the whole um, citizen science thing that she does where local people or, uh, tourists can take a picture of a jaguar and if you're the first one you get to name it you know and it goes in a book and your name goes under the photograph and you know everybody you know she gets on she I was looking I'm working on the future version of this film and I was looking at some footage and she got on the radio and she was saying in Portuguese that Juru's here and he's doing xyz and you know these guys they know the names of these jaguars they know, you know, they've learned the families and you can, um, Rio is one of the first cubs you see in this short film. And he's, he's a little boy cub. He's Medrosa's cub and he's very vocal. You know, he, he goes, you know, he cries a little <laughs> bit because he's looking for his mom. His mom was across the little inlet, but he's, he's in the feature film, he vocalizes three different three different times he's that's his personality you can see their personalities and he's just he's just talkative <laughs> it's that's, really neat yeah I loved that you pointed that out too in the documentary oh, like oh uh, her name is mid Rosa because she's timid right it means timid yeah. in Portuguese so yeah no that's just beautiful yeah. And I think, you know, they're talking about maybe introducing jaguars into, um, you know, there are actually two males in Arizona that have been seen, but no females. <clears throat> and, you know, part of part of part of what we're looking at as we try to create a sustainable world is living in harmony with wildlife. And I, I even saw a short documentary in Africa about people who were living in harmony with that clients. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to, you know, they're not, they're not your pet. They're not your friend. You don't want to befriend them. That endangers you and them, but you don't mess with their food source. But, you know, if you're prudent and you don't take unnecessary risks, you know, they're, you can, coexist with them there was one jaguar that came into the, the park and his name was tusk and he was charging boats 
when he first came in and he chilled out after a while. And I think he probably came from an area where he was, I'm guessing he came from an area where he was illegally hunted because hunting is illegal in, in Brazil. You cannot hunt wild animals. And that's part of the reason why you there is this coexistence because they're not being hunted. And that's a big deal. Oh yeah, no, that's, I mean, I can only imagine like, right. So I think like animals have those reflexes of like, they can sense like, oh yeah, this is a safe haven or yeah, I got to be on guard for things like, but it reminds me, this is kind of the opposite of like, I saw that documentary on Netflix about like, um, Sea World, I believe it was called where they had the uh, whales in captivity doing like tricks and and all that um mm -hmm. you know and it and it's heartbreaking because they were you know you're taking this animal that's meant to be out in the wild and just narrowing its world it's like in prison basically mm -hmm. um you know and it's passed off as entertainment and it's okay for the animal or you know so it's hard and i, I and um their trainers had died um, mm -hmm. you know, they were killed eventually, um, a few of them. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really devastating. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think I think it was Shamu, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the um I, pardon me if I'm saying something wrong, but anyway. <laughs> I mean, I know what you're talking about, and you know, that's one of the things it's that's so heart heartwarming about being able to see them live their lives in freedom, you know, they come and go, they're free. They're, the park is not fenced. So they live outside the park. And so we, we saw jaguars inside the park and outside the park. I mean, jaguars are all over the Pantanal, all over the Amazon, all over the Sahara. I mean, they're wild animals, but you know, these areas are really endangered. The Pantanal is endangered because the Amazon is, is dying i mean it it really 80 percent of it needs to be protected by next year to keep it alive and part of the reason is 17 percent deforested 34 percent degraded you know we're like the underbrush and you know is is you know that those levels are degraded but one of the big things that's happening now too is the drought south america has had five years of severe drought large areas of South America and I mean I think this is year five and so the you know the Amazon creates its own weather because it it has respiration it creates you know condensation which becomes clouds which becomes flying rivers and the flying rivers of atmospheric moisture have more water in them than their land rivers but those are depleted and the, that moisture those flying rivers affect the rain all the way up in wisconsin in the united states and all over the world the amazon cools both the atlantic and the pacific oceans and so we're seeing ocean warming from climate change from fossil fuels oil coal and gas but we're also seeing it because the amazon is degraded um, and nobody's really talking about that um, and, you know, the drought is caused by fossil fuels because, you know, oil, coal, and gas, they, you know, they release tr heat trapping chemicals that warm our atmosphere, you know, so, you know, the water stays up in the air longer and it collects and it gets bigger. And so we have a drought and then when it releases, it creates floods or these rain deluges of 12 inches and in 12 hours or whatever you know what we had in Miami recently and places all over the world are experiencing those kinds of floods South America had horrific floods you know South Brazil so you know the it's affecting the Pantanal because Pantanal is getting less rain it naturally floods every year in, the, in a healthy way because it's People have, you know, people don't get flooded because they live in higher areas, and but it floods, and those fl from the rivers and the floods and the rain bring fish, fish bring birds, caiman, wildlife, jaguars, 
So, you know, that replenishment of the waters and the fish every year really keeps the Pantanal alive. And in 2020, when the fires were so bad, it didn't flood at all. Wow. So that, you know, that was really a bad situation. The Pantanal is burning already now in Carumba, which is south, and I apologize for my pronunciation, but it's south east a little bit of where I was in Porto Joffre, but there are a few fires in a little bit northeast, and that's very abnormally early. Um, so they're worried about this year. And also the flood season used to be six months and now it's five months. So it's, shr it's also shrinking in that way. Um, so, I mean, it's hard. I think people seem to have a hard time understanding that the Amazon keeps us alive and affects our climate here in the United States. It just seems like it's somewhere else, but it's, we are entwined with the Amazon. And, you know, I've been writing, I've written our president numerous times, President Biden. I've written my congressman. I wrote Kamala Harris about the Amazon that we've got to step up support, you know, for Brazil to protect the Amazon. And part of what's happening too, and I'm sorry, I'm talking so long. No, but... no, this is fascinating. I'm so appreciative. I mean, you know, this is how we get the word out. Yeah. Cargill, you know, Cargill is a big soybean company. They produce numerous projects, but soybean is a big one. And it's a large, corp very large transnational corporation. And there, they have been one of the comp corporations that's really planted the Sahado savanna next to the Pantanal, half with soybeans. Um, so it's, they are a big soybean exporter. And those soybeans, there's other companies too, they're going out of the country. They're not feeding Brazilians. And soybeans have shallow roots. So they're replacing natural grasses that have longer roots. And those longer roots pull water into the underground aquifers in Brazil that provides drinking water for the whole country. So soybean is starving those aquifers. Wow. On, top, on top of that, Cargill wants to build a railroad through the Amazon rainforest and plant GMO crops, according to what I read from Amazon Watch. And so they've been funding the far right agribusiness lobby in Brazil, who wants, who is, <clears throat> is trying to overturn the constitution of Brazil, which guarantees land and other rights to indigenous people. And of course, indigenous people are the number one people in the world present protecting 80% of our pristine biodiversity that's left. And Amazon, ind indigenous people are really keeping the Amazon alive right now. They're, you know, you see films like um, We Are Guardians. If you haven't seen that film, it's on Disney Plus, And it is a very, very powerful film about how indigenous people are protecting the Amazon and, and fighting for their lives, you know, so. Yeah. This, I just can't say thank you enough for shedding a light on this topic. Just really, and um, you could tell it's your your life's passion. Um, you know the way you speak about it, the way you captured it, and I'm very happy to hear you're making it into a feature. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm excited. And you know, I think one other thing that I want to say. I mean, <clears throat> when we, whenever we vote for the next for November for the next. 30 years, we have got to look at what our candidates are, what, you know, how they feel about climate change and whether they're going to address it. Because um, Antonio Guterres, I mean, Antonio Guterres just spoke at the American Museum of Natural History in June, and he said the next 18 months will decide how much of life on earth we can save by wow. according to the decisions that our leaders make. And he said, the next 18 months are, are cr critical and we will decide what happens to life on earth in this decade, in this decade. So, you know, and he said, 
I mean, this is the IPCC inter I can't I never remember that acronym, but they, you know, 1.5 global average temperature temperatures is the is a physical limit. It's not a goal, he said. It's a physical limit. And if we hit that limit continuously, the you know, ice ice is gonna melt in five different places and it's gonna be catastrophic. So we've got to not hit that limit for long periods of time, which means we have to cut use of, of fossil fuels in half by roughly in half, that's an estimate by 2030. No new projects after next year, really no new projects now, but you know, no new oil, gas, coal, liquid nat natural gas, none of that, none of this carbon capture, you know, that's a false solution. It's not going to cut it. You know, the carbon offsets, most of them, Al Gore said, COP28, they're bogus. They're mm -hmm. worthless. So carbon captus, capture is another scheme to prolong use of, of fossil fuels. And, you know, we can't, life on earth is at stake at this point. And we've never been here in this way as humans. And so we, a lot of us were sleeping through a global emergency. And I think the global South has really been hit hard. Africa and South America have been hit really hard. But you know, California's burning, New Mexico's burning in places, you know, and they're having floods. I mean, it's, you know, Texas is about to get hit by barrel. And, you know, and Mexico just is getting hit. And of course, Jamaica and the other islands have already gotten hit. And that's a category storm in June. That's unheard of. Wow. You know. Uh, and it, now it is, is so like, you know, I mean, to say that it's, you know, just alarming is an understatement. I wonder, though, because I heard like, like I know it says in your documentary, it points to like suggestions like go green and banking and everything like that. And there's things as citizens we can do. But I liked what you touched on before, too, that it's really the leadership. Um, because like, right, I heard like um, Coke and Pepsi, let's say, like they never like recycle, like every um, mm -hmm. bottle is new plastic that they're making. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it just um, this problem you know, seems like so at odds, like money versus sustainability. It just seems like it's, you know, the divide is too great. And us as ordinary citizens, I mean, I feel like we could recycle until, you know, <laughs> we're throwing our bones into the bins. <laughs> um, but it doesn't feel like it's moving the needle. Um, well, a yeah. lot of groups, you know, they just had, they're having summer of heat right now where they're putting a lot of pressure on the big banks that fund, you know, fund fossil fuels. Um, you know, Biden's um, IRA, um, you know, his, know. his bill is really helped renewables take off. So renewables are going, they're already cheaper than fossil fuels. If we remove subsidies for, from fossil fuels, they will tank in the marketplace completely. Um, so I just heard Jane Fonda speak at the Hollywood Climate Summit online, and she basically said renewables are inevitable. They are going to take over. Um, but the question is, is it fast enough to save enough and to save the life, you know, on earth? So I think we can vote for people who care about climate, especially this November. I mean, this is a critical time and we've got to look who's being funded by corporations, who of our, you know, who of our, our, our local people, I mean, all the way down the ballot, everyone has got to care about climate change, you know, and care about democracy so that, so that communities matter you know, the environment matters. So we've got to really research and, and vote for people who care about climate. And then we've got to keep the pressure on our legislators and keep the pressure on our leadership, you know, and the rights of nature is another big thing. 
countries all over the all over the world and in uh, the Ponca Nation in Texas just created the rights of nature so that to keep fossil fuels out because they were having 10,000 earthquakes in Oklahoma. Wow. So the rights of nature can be done in a community to protect a river or stream, you know, or a little forest or, you know, the rights of nature is a really big deal. And we can, all caps, W-E-C-A-N, Women's Earth Climate Action Network, um, is also works with the global rights of nature movement. Um, but Ecuador has rights of nature in its in its constitution. I love your thoughts on this. But have you heard of HARP? Yes. What do you think of that? Harp, that's the, that's the, um, I do not think it's creating climate change. I'll say that much. And I, I researched, I, I spent 30 years doing um, global economics. Do you have some information we can, because I know some people might have heard about it. Um, and the way I've seen it painted is, <laughs> like it's the government that's causing climate change. Uh <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it is conspiracy theory from the research that I've done. I did spend about an hour researching it about a month ago and I, I've read about it years ago as well. Um, you know, they've opened that laboratory area. I think it's in Alaska many times to the public for people to go in and view it. Um, we don't, you know, we don't have the technology to, to do what the conspiracy theory says that we're doing. We just don't have it. I mean, even some attempts to salt clouds to prevent whatever, they were not successful, you know? So I really think that, yeah, I, I I can't say anything about the motivation of the people who are pushing that. Um, I know that the fossil fuel industry is very, very invested in continuing to do what it's doing. Um, even aside from the fact that it causes climate change, fossil fuels, <clears throat> it causes many, many, many deaths from cancers, from respiratory diseases. You know, I just... I just listened to Jane Fonda's granddaughter who grew up very, very living in close proximity to an oil well. She has had to have reproductive surgery. She can't have children because she had cancer and she had severe nosebleeds as a kid. I mean, this is a child. I saw her earlier. I didn't know she was Jane Fonda's daughter, granddaughter. And I mean, th this is real. And since California started having a good influx of EV vehicles, electric vehicles, not even as many as they thought, the hospitalizations for respiratory diseases have gone down dramatically. Wow. You know, just from, so these, you know, these fumes and these, you know, the meth, these, these plants, they flare methane during the day. You can't see it, but... I saw a documentary of people who had special equipment and it'll, sh you can film it because it'll, I, I don't know if it's infrared or what it is. I don't know the technology, but they did a whole documentary sh where they filmed these flares and methane is even more powerful than, you know, in terms of warming the climate than fossil fuels. So I, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's ethical to push theories like that. I'm not talking about you because <laughs> mm -hmm. people have questions, you know, and it raises and, you know, for decades, the fossil fuel industry hired PR people to, you know, throw doubt about climate change, you know, and, you know, first it was, oh, is climate change not really real. Then it was, oh, it's not really man-made. It's a natural phenomenon. No, it's not a natural phenomenon. I mean, if you look at the research, we are way, I mean, we're on another planet out of bounds of what we're supposed to be having in terms of carbon in our atmosphere. 
And, you know, the fossil fossil fuels make a small number of people very, very rich. And, you know, they bring in these man camps, they, you know, build a well, and they don't require the kind, they don't create long-term jobs. You know, these are the same man camps in California that are carrying off, you know, indigenous women and creating sexual violence and, and some horrific things. Um, not all people, but these man camps do breed that kind of activity. And then um, renewable energy, solar and wind, they require maintenance. So they create permanent jobs and they create even the installation. I mean, small companies can do that. So it creates a lot of jobs. It creates it builds the middle class, but nobody's going to get rich off of it. Nobody's going to get rich off of it like fossil fuels. And so, you know, we have dynasty families in this country from fossil fuels, from oil. You know, right, generation sure. after generation, the Bushes, the Rockefellers, you know, different people, different groups. And, you know... Coke Industries, I mean, you've got all these these extremely rich people who pay PR companies and and propaganda cor corporations like the Heritage Foundation to create a confusion. narrative that they confusion. want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and right now we've got Project 2025. I don't know if you've heard of that. That is not conspiracy theory. It is on the internet. You can read it. It is a platform that a particular um, political party is espousing, and it would eliminate a lot of our federal institutions like the Department of Education, um, public education as we know it. Funding would go away. Um, it would eliminate any language about climate change. It would reverse <clears throat> Biden's IRA, which provides funding for, <clears throat> you know, renewable energy, but also a lot of other things like, you know, the Chips and Science Act and, you know, all of these different bringing manufacturers, factoring back to the United States and building the middle class. It would reverse that. So it would push oil and fossil fuels. Um, so it's really important to educate yourself about Project 2025 and go to the website. Don't just read the little PR piece in the beginning. Go, it's a 900 page document. Oh but my if, goodness. But if you go to the chapters, if you just go, like I went to this section on Department of Education because it has a table of contents. And in the first paragraph, it said it would eliminate the Department of Education. So I didn't have to read very far <laughs> you know, to find out. So that's another reason why we really need to research our candidates. You just look them up online. It's not hard. I mean, you know, last time I voted, I looked up every single candidate. I looked for their platform. If they didn't have a platform, you know, I wanted to know what I was voting for, who I was voting for, what they stand for, and what they're going to do if they're in office. You know, who's funding them? You can you can look up who's funding anyone. You can look up who, who's funding the New York Times. The New York Times is publicly traded, which means it's, you know, it's owned by stockholders. Since two of its biggest stockholders are Vanguard Bank and BlackRock, and they both fund fossil fuels. So that tells you a little bit about what they Which stand way. for. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I wanted to go back to, you brought up an important point, like I said before, like, you know, and I, I didn't mean to put down recycle. I, I do it myself. Oh, I know, I know. You know what I mean? Like, um, and to your point that you said, um, you know, look up your candidates. Like, you know, I know by me, um, if I didn't recycle, like nobody would care. Nobody would even know really. But like, you know, in Sicily, like you get fined if you don't recycle. It's mandatory. Like every day is a different kind of garbage that, you, you know, it's either your mixed garbage, you know, like just what you're, you're cooking scraps and everything or your recyclables. And if you don't do it, you are fined like hundreds of dollars. Um, okay. 
you know, so maybe, you know, the government's the only, you know, I hate to say the only solution, um, but, you know, it has to be in tandem, I guess, is what I'm trying to say a bit more like to your point of like, yeah, seeing where, you know, papers that are putting out a certain platform, you know, and, uh, pushing a certain narrative who is funding them, you know, and it, it's, it's just very tricky in the world today because just like, you know, that sounds like a lot of work to people that are just like, you know, I'm just trying to get to my job, you know? So, I mean, it, it it's, it's a complicated place we live in, but yeah, you know, I, I didn't, I just wanted to clarify cause I didn't want to diminish the power of the individual, but um, you know, I, like you say, really try to vote for people who are in line with, um, and for people who didn't know what HARP, what we were talking about, it is some program that like came out in the nineties, right. Mm -hmm. That claimed they knew how to manipulate weather. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I thought about it when, you know, that thing with the, the balloon that flew over and they're like, oh yeah, it's a weather balloon, like a Chinese weather balloon or something, a weather balloon from China. Um, you know, that's what made me remember, uh, you know, that whole um, conversation. Well, and I think you were trying to say earlier when you were talking about recycling that we spend a lot of time recycling, but then the corporations don't do anything with it. And that's come out recently. And, you know, there's a, a woman, Bron Bron Bronte McCorkle, and she was talking recently at a conference and she said, you know, the fossil fuel don't the fossil fuel industry wants to make it our problem because they don't want to face out fossil fuels. They want to talk about recycling. They want to talk about, you know, let's not eat meat. Let's all do the big issue. The big issue is phasing out fossil fuels. And if we don't do that, nothing else will cut it. And they want to distract from that. So anything they can do to distract from that, you know, they're going to do. And I think we do have grade B corporations. That's a new thing. You probably know about it. Um, if they have ethical standards. And Patagonia went from being a regular for-profit to becoming a grade B corporation. But they've just now become recently... I think in the last year, a nonprofit and, you know, the nonprofit model, you can still make, you can pay people well, you can make it a cooperative where people make decisions together. You know, you can reinvest in, as far as I know, you can reinvest in the, in what you're doing. Um, it's, it's, it's a promising model for a sustainable future if we continue to have corporations wreaking havoc that refuse to care about humanity and life on earth, you know, and if you look at agribusinesses too, they're, you know, these factory farms and these large agribusinesses that are cutting down rainforests all over the world, you know, football fields at a time, that's another issue. We, we have now the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty that is being it was created by small island nations that are, you know, being submerged and they're having ground, salty groundwater come up through the water. So you can't even plant crops. Some of them, you know, you've got people in boats trying to escape the chronic flooding um, who are refugees. Um, but they created the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and that's catching on. It's, I think Colombia has signed it a lot of, nations have signed it we have not signed it yet but that is you know that is part of the push to create a time frame a a strictly enforced time frame for phasing out fossil fuels um you know so that that's an important thing we could also create an agribusiness non-proliferation treaty to move to organic regenerative farming that in, in that there, there is regenerative farming for pasture raised animals too. They found, they realize, and I watched, uh, I watched a discussion of this at COP22 of nonprofits and they've done research and 
you know, having pasture raised animals does do important things for the environment. It packs down the soil, it spreads seeds. There are a lot of different things, you know, their droppings help with fertilization. I mean, it. I think it even is relates to the weather. I, I'm not sure how I could be wrong about that, but it was very, I mean, there was a lot of ways that pasture raised animals are helping the environment, not harming the environment. And you think about it, I mean, animals have existed for a gazillion years and they did not create enough methane with their excretion right, right. <laughs> to harm the earth. It's not coming from animals, although factory farms are a different issue, you know. But if we move back to, patent, you know, pa organic pasture raised farms, which there are some, um, that is sustainable. So I always, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I always thought I had a thought like, you know, like in the Bible, like some people lived like to 190 something. I always like, you know, I always wondered if it's because the earth, you know, the air was so pure or, you know, the food was so, you know, rich with nutrients yeah. You know, um, you know, some people dismiss it. Oh, it's just like a mystical thing. Like, oh, it was just um, symbolic, that number or something. But I really wonder if it's because of what we've done to the earth. Um, I mean, I think that's a very interesting question. There are people who are living. Actually, there's a fair amount of people now who are living 116. You know, they're living well over 100 and some of them are you know high they're walking around they're they're in their right mind so it's we don't know these are things we don't know you know and I think I think even raising that as an, a question highlights the urgency of the ways that we need to protect our nature you know um and we're in a huge biodiversity crisis too, not just a climate crisis. I mean, we are losing species, we're losing birds, we're losing bees, we're losing insects. You know, I, I'm I'm of the generation, I remember being a kid and we would drive to Florida on vacation and the love bugs were all over the, they were called love bugs because they were always mating. There's little black bugs. I don't know if you ever saw them, but they covered you know, the windshield, of course, you're wiping them off. But then the grill of your car was just black with <laughs> love bugs. And, you know, now you don't see them anymore, you know. And, you know, I'm sure no one really misses love bugs, but bees, you know, butterflies, a monarch butterfly. I mean, sea, ocean, you know, seabirds, coastal birds, those are declining. I mean, we can't lose birds. They're, you know, I mean, it's just lots of animals, you know, it, it's a, it's, we've got to learn to live within the, we got to learn to live with nature and not, not continue to pillage it. Exactly. No, I, I just want to get back um to the filmmaking side. I, this sure. is so important. Um, <laughs> And I can't thank you enough for your time. And again, Thank you for making such a beautiful film. Obviously, again, you did win <laughs> the short form documentary category, um, but you are making it into a feature. So what was that process like for you? Um, are you in the editing phases right now? When do you think it'll be out? All of that good stuff, if you could walk us through. Well, thank you for asking. And thank you again for honoring my film in this way. Um, so I am in post-production and I'm hoping to finish it by August 1st this summer and put it out in film festival. So I'll definitely send it your way. Um, and it will, it, this is kind of, it's, it's a climate change adventure film. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I really love the adventure part. You know, I'm I'm not a doom and gloom person. And and Al Gore said as soon as we stop putting fossil fuels in the air, 
the earth will immediately start to cool. I mean, it's, there's really good news out there. And in 30 years, the rest of the carbon will be gone. It'll go away. I heard just to this point again, like I heard like if you took like a Roman soldier, like a soldier that, you know, was alive during like gladiator times or something and put him in the environment today, he wouldn't be able to breathe because his lungs aren't equipped to, you know, oh, wow. I guess move around all the stuff we have in it or yeah I don't know any I'm sorry go ahead I know it's, no, that's it's, okay mm -hmm. that's that's interesting um but the be you know so there'll be it's it there's a lot more beautiful nature photography there's music in it um the middle section you know the the beginning is serious but then the the middle is really it has a lot of adventure it has some humor and it has beautiful nature photographies get to know that jaguars a little more um and then the solutions so there are some solutions in the beginning and some solutions at the end there's more explanation about rights of nature which i think is really exciting new zealand has recognized a, the wanganui river as having personhood so the columbia supreme court recognized the amazon river ecosystem so that's really hopeful because you know, the Amazon, I think, is in about five different countries. Colombia is one of them. Brazil has the largest area of the Amazon. So, you know, there's a lot of good news and a lot of solutions, a lot of empowerment in this film and some fun and some adventure out on the river. There's a lot of footage out on the rivers. Um, so I'm, it. you know, I love editing because I love putting the story together and um, it's just, I'm really having fun finishing the film. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and I hope you get it in front of the eyes of some of those people that could make the decisions to help eliminate those fossil fuels. Yeah. I'm hoping to, I really do want to do that with this film. Um, that's one of my hopes for sure. And this all like, correct me if I'm wrong. So did you did you get all this footage on just that one trip or did you have to go back out or just one trip and you got it all? Wow. Yeah, I, you know, we were out on the river by about 8 or 8.30 in the morning, came back maybe around 5. We stayed out all day, ate lunch in the boat. Um, but then I was doing interviews in the most of the evenings and then I was you know, 1130 at night, I was downloading footage. So, you know, and then when I went out two days with Joseph and Oz photo safaris, um, just to get more footage of wildlife, I went out nine days with Abby. She wow. was kind enough to take me out nine days. Um, and so those days with Van Oz were earlier, much earlier. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I was working you know, 16 to 20 hours a day for, wow. for those days that I was there, but it was, I loved it, you know? Yeah. Um, so. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, Susan, I think, I think we're good unless there's anything else you wanted to add. Um, I, just, I just want to add one more thing. Sure, sure. If this film ever makes any money or there is a donate button on the the website is saving jaguars and ourselves.com but the people in Forto Joffre you know it takes four to five hours to get out there across 120 wooden brick bridges that are rickety and they wash out so they have no medical clinic they have no me they don't even have a nurse they have nothing except once a year a medical boat comes through I think in November so they have to drive all that way to go to the doctor, to go to the dentist. And, you know, it would really be nice to be able to, you know, donate some money to um, go towards a medical clinic there for yeah. people. You know, if somebody, you know, somebody falls ill or somebody, you know, gets injured, you know, nobody wants to drive across a road that's like this with an injury or when they're sick. Sure. For five hours. <laughs> My goodness. 
So the people mm -hmm. near Pantanal or in Pantanal have to drive five hours over a crickety road just to get any kind of medical attention whatsoever. I think you have a documentary within a documentary going on here. <laughs> That's it. That's in the Porto Joffre area where I was, which is near the Jaguar Park. And that's where a lot of the ecotourism, it's happening in other places too, but that's an ecotourism center. It's where Panthera is. Panthera operates a school for children for free, local children. So, you know, that's, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's a take action section on my website also. And there's places where you can donate to the Jaguar Identification Project and also Panthera Brazil directly and the Giant Otter product. Those are all nonprofits. So if somebody wanted to donate something to them directly, those links are on the Take, take Action page. And of course, if they wanted to donate to help with the film, they could do that. So fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Susan Furs. Um, I just think you're wonderful. I think you're <laughs> such a light and such a gifted filmmaker. I would have never had guessed, um, you know, one person crew, I mean, did this whole documentary. It's just stunning. I mean, seriously, you can, you feel like those Jaguars are just like right next to you. And I, it's just beautifully captured as well as so meaningful. So just thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katarina. Your words mean so much to me. They really do because I've been kind of, you know, you spend a lot of time by yourself when you're editing, <laughs> you know, and it, oh, it yeah. really has meant a lot. It's meant so much for the recognition and for your kind words, I appreciate it. And thank you for having me today and interviewing and the chance to talk about this film and the amazing people who are in it, who inspire me, you know, yeah. and you inspire me too in what you're doing. I think it's tremendous. Thank you. Yeah. Feeling is mutual. You are tremendous. Thank you for the beautiful undertaking that you have done and all the information you're putting out there in such a lovely 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 way thank yeah. you thank you so much Kat katarina thank you